Um, it is awesome to be here with you this morning. Um, Bethesda is such a beautiful space to be in on a Sunday morning, and I try my best every time I get an opportunity to hold a mic here to hype this church, because this church is just doing some amazing things, not only in the church community, but the community that surrounds it. Um, and that's truly what the essence of a church is supposed to be. And so if you this morning, maybe when they gave that call for an offering, and you were kind of having a little bit of doubts about maybe that 20 or 200 or maybe we'll cross your fingers, $20,000 donation maybe that you wanted to give. Amen. Can I just tell you, yes, Pastor Bruce. Can I just tell you, this is such a great space for you to invest in and support in that way. Um, many of you, you've had such a long journey here at Bethesda and you've experienced such amazing support and guidance and celebration in the things in that your life. And for some of you, maybe it's your first time here. This is a space worthwhile investing in. So please, um, if that's something that's on your heart, do that. The future of this church is very bright and it's such an honor to be a part of that. So do that. I promise you, you will not regret it. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the room. Um, when I say dad or father or anything like that this morning, I want to say right from the beginning, I don't mean just biological fathers. Um, I spent three years as a youth pastor um, in Ontario, and it gave me a really great opportunity to witness firsthand what a spiritual father or mother can be in someone's life. Uh, where many people, they haven't had the best kind of experience or relationship with their biological mother or father, and either it's a youth leader or a parent of a friend has stepped into that person's life and has led them in such an amazing way. So happy Father's Day, not only to the biological fathers, but the spiritual fathers in the room um, and who are watching online. It's such an amazing opportunity to do that as well. Um, we are talking about dad advice this morning. Dad advice. Advice, And we're going to look at a book uh, called Matthew. It's in the New Testament, which is the second half of the Bible. It's the first book there. Uh, Matthew is what's known as a gospel, which gives kind of four different, or there's four gospels, and they each give different unique perspectives of Jesus' life here on earth. Um, we're going to read from Matthew chapter 17. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, uh, you can read along with me or it'll be on the screen in front of you as well. Does anyone have a father or a father figure in your life who gives, who loves to give advice. Anybody have a father like that? Even, maybe not a father, a mother, a grandparent, some authority figure in your life. Anybody have someone like that? You're just, yeah, they love, they give advice. A lot of times it's unsolicited advice. You know, the advice that you just really don't want and you hate. You know, anybody have a figure like that? Out of all the advice we can get from anybody though, dad advice is very unique. And some of you are like, yes. All the like daughters in the room are like, yes, I agree with you. You know, father advice is very unique. It is highly practical, highly practical. Not necessarily the most or philosophically deep, but it's very practical. And a lot of times just not wanted. <laughs> Agreed? I want to give you my top five dad advice quotes. And some of you will recognize these. These were sep uh, submitted to a popular TV show in light of Father's Day. Um, and these, I think, are just the classic examples of what dad advice are. So here they are. So dad advice number one. They'll be on the screen as well. The only essential oils are for wings, fries, and donuts. Every other oil is not essential. Okay? I'm with that one. Dad advice number two, if your flight leaves at 5 p.m., be ready at 5 a.m. Anyone have a father like that? My father-in-law is like that. He went on a trip to Mexico with my wife one time. Their flight left at 5 a.m. He showed up at 1 a.m. in case there was a snowstorm. And I'm pretty sure it was like October in Ontario. He's like that. Dad advice number three, if something is delicious, then it has absolutely zero calories in it. Yes, I think I wrote that one myself. Dad advice number four, only ask for help if duct tape can't fix it. And number five, you should always add three to four weeks to get the real expiration date on something. Yes, assuming you have a lot of sour milk in your fridges. Being a father is one of the biggest honors in life. I really believe that. I'm five weeks in, or five, five weeks, five months. Feels like five weeks. 
I'm five months in, and it is probably the best thing that I've ever experienced. But at the same time, the responsibility of it can come with a lot of stress of wanting to be the perfect father, of never messing up and always having the right thing to say. And this morning, we're looking at a story of a father who he's in this dire situation, and his advice, I think, will help And not just the fathers in the room, but the mothers or just in everybody in being a great human. So let's take a look at it. Matthew 17, verse 14 to 20. It says that at the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Jesus said, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon in the boy and it left him. And from that moment, the boy was well. Afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, why couldn't we cast out that demon? And Jesus said, you do not have enough faith. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, You could say to this mountain behind us, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible for you. So right before this story, Jesus and three disciples, Peter, James, and John, they head up to this mountain, on top of this mountain. And while they're there on top of this mountain, Elijah and Moses appear before them. Elijah was this like major prophet that we can read about in the Old Testament. And Moses actually freed the Israelites from Egypt, from slavery. So they're the major kind of figures within the biblical narrative. And while they're on top of this mountain, they see Moses and Elijah. And it's this crazy experience for these disciples. They had heard stories about these men. Had heard just crazy, unreal experiences that were all led through these men. So to see them in front of them, this was just a wow, an awe kind of crazy moment for them. And so they leave and Jesus and the disciples are walking back down the mountain and Jesus looks at them and says, hey, do not tell anyone what you just saw. I know how amazing it was, but do not tell a soul what just happened up here. And the disciples are like, all right, I get it, I get it, but like, Jesus, like, I got their autograph, like, I want to show this off, like, no, do not tell a soul. They get down to the bottom of the mountain And this man runs up to Jesus. He says, hey, Jesus, please have mercy on my son. He suffers terribly from seizures. And a lot of times they lead to physical harm in his life. Please, can you help him? Can you heal him? Can you please do something to help my boy? And Jesus says, well, I have disciples. Did you go to them? Why'd you wait for me? And the man says, I went to your disciples. You know, the other ones that weren't on the mountain with you, I went to them. They could not heal my boy. Please do something to help my boy. And Jesus' response to them is extremely harsh. (laughs) It's the responses that Jesus has that I don't like reading or even talking about because I just want this Jesus to be this like fuzzy rainbow unicorn kind of figure. But sometimes he can be very serious (laughs) and it's hard to take. And his response in the moment is really harsh. He looks out over the crowd and the disciples that weren't with him on the mountain. He says, you faithless and corrupt people. Whoa. (laughs) Really, Jesus? (laughs) No, we're only human. You faithless and corrupt people. How much longer do I have to be here with you? How much longer do I have to put up with you? It's really harsh, hey? (laughs) I think we kind of got to put into perspective Jesus in this moment. He had just been up on top of this mountain with his disciples and had just an amazing experience where these three disciples, they grew crazily in their journey with him. And it was this high, very celebratory, exciting experience. And he felt for a moment that the disciples, the ones at least that were on the mountain with him, they were getting it. They had an experience that told them what this life was all about about. And so he's riding on this high. (laughs) And all of a sudden he comes down at the bottom of a mountain 
and the rest of the disciples, they can't heal this boy. This father who has this son who is just in a dire situation is extremely stressed and nervous and sad about this. And for a moment, Jesus just thinks, oh man, I thought they were getting it. I thought they could understand this. It's kind of a a feeling of being let down in this moment. And it actually is reminiscent of an experience that Moses, who they saw on this mountain, had. Moses in Exodus chapter 17, this is after he had led them out of Egypt. They kind of camp out in this space, and at this place that they were in, there was no drinking water for them. And now remember, God, using Moses, had led them out of slavery, had freed them from this. And they get to this place, and there's no drinking water. And thirst begins to set in. And they start to complain. They start to kind of talk to each other, saying, oh, Moses took, this, took us here to kill us. He took us here you know, to make us kind of die of thirst. And they go to Moses and say, hey, you've got to fix this. You've got to do something here. What, how are you going to save us from this situation? And Moses is just overwhelmed with the complaints. And he goes to God and says, like, what do I do here? <laughs> what do you want me to do with these people? You know, you just freed them from slavery. Isn't that enough? <laughs> you've taught them so much about what it means to follow you. Like, what do you want me to do with them? It's this moment of oh, I thought you got it, but you don't, obviously. You know, for any teachers in the room who are watching online, maybe you've had a student where all of a sudden they continue to progress in their math or their English and they're learning stuff really quickly and doing well in their marks and all of a sudden they just are not getting something, it just drops and it's a moment of frustration just thinking, oh, I thought they were just on this really great path. What is happening? It's just this moment of, oh, after a great awesome moment of celebrating. It's just, oh, here we are again, another lesson I have to teach them. So Jesus, in this moment of being kind of let down, he says to them, bring the boy to me. And so they bring the boy to him, and Jesus realized that this man, this boy has a demon, and he casts out the demon, and we read that this boy lived healthy and well from then on. And that's where that story of this father ends. Now the disciples, the nine who weren't on the mountaintop, they look at the situation and think, why couldn't we do this? <laughs> you know, we know he's taught us so many things. You know, he actually sent us out so that we could do this, so that we could heal and teach and do all the things that he's done. Why couldn't we do this ourselves? And one of them, they get kind of the I don't know, the guts enough to ask Jesus, why couldn't we do this, Jesus? What is it that's different about us? And Jesus says, you didn't have enough faith. If you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could move this mountain behind you. Nothing would be impossible for you. You just didn't have enough confidence that of what I could do through you in that moment. And that's where our story ends. Now, some of you are thinking, what does this have to do with fatherhood? (laughs) Some of you, you know this story very well. You've heard that line, faith the size of a mustard seed, a thousand times at least. And a lot of times we use this story to talk about how much faith we have. And this past Sunday at Mosaic, we chatted about measuring faith. But the strange thing was, as I was preparing for Mosaic last Sunday with this passage, I couldn't get my thoughts off the father in this story and where he was in this situation. A lot of times we can focus in on the faith piece and the disciples and Jesus, and that makes sense. But I couldn't get my eyes off this father, saying, wow, what a situation he was in. A father who loved his son dearly, and probably up to that point had been doing everything he could to fix the issues that were going on and came to a kind of a screeching halt of realizing there is nothing I can do here, which probably left him feeling helpless, maybe even useless, and unworthy to be a father. It's moments like that where failure sets in of, ah, I'm not good enough to do this. The thing is, to me, this father is the perfect example of the perfect father. 
where in a moment where he had nowhere else to go, he had no idea what to do, he didn't give up. He said, I'm going to go to the one who knows exactly what to do, (laughs) who knows exactly how to help in this situation. The one who I've heard who can heal, who can restore, who can fix these kind of situations that we have no idea how to handle them. We don't know how long this kind of went on in his son's life, but I'm sure it led to a lot of certain experiences and circumstances that led to a lot of trauma. There's moments where his physical health was at risk because of the situation. I'm sure this father at moments was at an all-time low, thinking that he was the worst father for that son. But as I look at his response, I think, man, you are the best father in this situation. Knowing that this was an experience, a circumstance way outside of your control, and you had no idea what to do next. And so you went to Jesus for help. And we read that that boy was well, was healthy from that day on. We have a lot of moments, whether you're a father, whether you're a mother, whether you're a friend, a grandparent, or just a simple human on this earth, where we have moments where we feel like we don't know what to do in, in situations and circumstances. We have no idea how we can help. It makes us feeling a little bit useless. <laughs> that we're not bringing any value to the situation, that we can't help at all. We have so many experiences like that that are so, so hard. And if I was to add a dad advice number six, it would be this. In those moments, the best thing you can do, the best thing you can do is go to Jesus the one who can help when you have no idea how to help, the one who can bring peace that you have no idea how to bring peace to the situation, who can bring comfort and strength like only he can. And if you go to him, I promise you, you and that situation you're in, you'll be able to see it in a whole new light. You'll have the strength, the joy, the comfort to take it day by day. And it may result in a healing like this boy experienced, or it may result in you being able to be there in that experience day after day after day, however long it goes on for. The best thing we can do, the best advice we can take is the advice of this father and go right to Jesus. In December of 2019, Rebecca and I found out we were pregnant. We had been trying for a little while, And it was a really kind of like joyous time in our house. Um, It was right around Christmas time. We were super excited. Started to tell some of our close family and let them know like that we were really excited about this, talking about doctor's appointments and buying all these things. It was a really joyous occasion. And the more days passed by, the more excited we got. But then the Thursday before Snowmageddon started, yes, Snowmageddon was a thing. The Thursday before Snowmageddon started, we went in and had an ultrasound in the hospital and found out that we had had a missed miscarriage. Um, I I can't describe to you the feelings that I had in that moment (laughs) without being very angry, without being hurt. It was really hard. And Rebecca had to go through a medical process, and I'm not going to go into the details of having this miscarriage. And there were so many moments where I had no idea how I could help her. I would stand there and just look at her and I had no idea what to do. And I remember there being moments where I would be so angry with God. (laughs) So angry. But it got to this breaking point where I just had to say, God, you need to comfort her in a way that I can't in this moment. God, you need to give me some kind of peace here so that I can be strong in this moment for what she's going through. And we went through that process and started the healing, and we started trying again. 
And in March of 2020, just a few months later, we got pregnant again. <laughs> Praise God. It was an amazing thing. But still kind of like holding our breath every day. Not really sure of what's going to happen. You know, we just went through a traumatic experience. And we didn't know what was going to happen here. And before that month had ended, we had miscarried again. Again. <laughs> So many moments of, God, I don't know how to be a husband here. I don't know how to help Rebecca in this moment. I, I need you to show me what I can do. I need you to be there for me. I need you to be there and bring a comfort and a peace and a strength like I can. And we went through that process of healing again. And in June of 2020, <laughs> this is where the story gets great again. <laughs> We find out we're pregnant. And even more before, we're holding our breath every day. <laughs> preparing for the worst, but also preparing for the greatest day of our lives at the same time. And in January of 2021, we welcomed this beautiful, amazing baby girl in our lives. And even through that whole pregnancy, I had moments of, I don't know how to help Rebecca here. You know, she's not confident that this is gonna be viable. She's not confident that this is gonna work out in a way where we're joyful. How do I be there for her? In all of those moments, the only thing I knew I could do was go to Jesus. And I'm not saying I'm the best father or husband in the room, because I had way more moments where I was angry with God than I asked him for help. But I really believe both of us going to Jesus got us through one of the hardest years we've been through in our six years of marriage. Snowmageddon was awful, COVID was hard, and through all of that, we'd gone through two miscarriages, and then Lennon was born, and it was hard. A lot of moments of feeling helpless. A lot of moments of not knowing what to do. Every time we went to Jesus, man, the peace that would come over us, the strength that would get us through the day, I can't describe it to you. It's unlike anything I've ever felt. And for some of you in the room, you're going through some very real circumstances like that, where your child, a loved one, a friend, going through such a hard time in life and you have no idea how to help. You have no idea what you can do. The best dad advice I can give you, <laughs> go to Jesus. Because <laughs> he can do things in certain situations that we never could. And just like that father who as last resort, not knowing what to do, went to Jesus and received help. We can do that here today. And it doesn't matter if you follow him or not, he's in front of you and he's there to help you. And you can just reach out and ask him for what you need. Now, some of you might be asking, Steve, okay, I get that, go to Jesus, but what does that even look like? There's three ways. You can pray about it, it's really important. Spending some time talking about your circumstance, Letting him know that you're angry about the situation. Letting him know your feelings. But then at the end of it saying, I believe in what you can do. Please help in ways that I cannot. So pray about it and then read about it. Pick this Bible up. Start reading the Gospels. Reading stories of where Jesus had helped people in so many dire situations and find comfort in that. Pray about it, read about it, and then chat about it. Find community that are in your steady 20 bubble. <laughs> they can say, hey, I'm going through this right now. I have no idea how to help in this situation. Can you pray for me? Is there any advice you can give me? You know, can you just check in with me every now and then? Pray about it, read about it, and chat about it. 
I believe those three things are the best ways that we can go to Jesus, saying, I need your help in this moment. And there's no better community to do that than Bethesda. (laughs) Your pastors are all stars. They're the best of the best. Reach out to them. The small groups here are incredible. Reach out to your small group. Message somebody. Say, I need help here. Can you guide me through this? But whoever you are and whatever circumstance you're going through, whatever situation you're facing with, doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, or what you will do. Jesus is there to help you, even when you have no idea to help. Make sense? Let me pray for you. And then we're going to take some time to sing. And maybe as we sing, you want to take that moment to say, Jesus, this is what I'm facing. Can you help me in this moment? Can you give me some guidance here? Can you give me some peace? Whatever that is. As they sing over this song, just take that moment to say, hey, Jesus, please help me. Father, I thank you so much for this community. God, I thank you for the history of this church and all that you've done. Lord, there are so many lives that have been transformed. Lord, lives that have been changed, um, that have then gone on to change other lives. And Lord, I believe that there is just crazy experiences that will happen through this church of people experiencing support through community and people whose lives are changed through you. So Lord, I pray that whatever the future may hold for Bethesda, God, whatever the vision may be, God, that you would be in it. God, that you would bring support, you would bring encouragement, you would bring creativity. God, I can't wait to hear the world-changing stories that come through this church. Lord, for the fathers, the mothers, the grandparents, the friends who are in the room, or who are walking along a a situation with somebody where they have no idea how to help. They have no idea how to be there. Lord, let them go to you today knowing that you can bring peace and comfort and strength and hope in some of the most dire situations, God. God, I pray that these moments would be opportunities for us to know you more. God, to grow in our journeys with you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this day. Lord, as we go and we celebrate fathers, as we celebrate the spiritual fathers, Lord, let's celebrate well. (laughs) Let's encourage, let's lift up those who need it today. Lord, we love you. We praise you in your name. Amen.